This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, quickly, uh, introduction of myself. Um, I'm currently the Associate Director of uh, Farm and Training and Farm Ecology. Um, and I'm also the co-owner of Roxbury Farm in Kinderhook, New York, um, which is a biodynamic farm in uh, 425 acres where we do uh, vegetables and pork, beef, and lamb. And the last uh, four years I've been involved with this project in Hurley, New York. Uh, it's about 1,200 acres of uh, farmland, uh, class one silt loam, form a sweet corn, uh, conventional sweet corn farm that I was asked to help transition to organic practices. So most of my task has been to help them, guide them through the process of uh, um, the rotation and uh, bringing this land into ecological practices. Part of that is that we're working with the Farmscape Ecology Program based in Harlemville, New York, uh, to not just look at uh, soil data, we're working with the soil health test um, to uh, monitor soil. We're also looking at water quality and looking at ecological qualities on the land. And we're in our third year, third year right now to do this monitoring and mapping and do some additional research. Um, but uh, in the context of, um, and do I have a clicker? I do. In the context really of um, the farmer training program that we started, which is really meant uh, to, uh, as the niche in the farmer training program that we have, there's a lot of them around in the Hudson Valley in New York, um, to see if we can have a farm and training program that can allow our students to scale up a little bit, prepare them for farm ownership. So it's an entrepreneurial training uh, whereby we really want to prepare them for farm ownership and with the ability to be exposed somewhat to working with equipment. One of the things that I do with my students is that I really want to push them a little harder. It's a nonprofit. Uh, we have a very cushy uh, environment in the sense that we can make mistakes. So I love making mistakes. Um, I've done it all my life, and uh, I was happy to continue doing that uh, while being paid for it. <laughs> and so one of the things that we were really struggling with is that, yes, we know how to grow vegetables, but can we grow vegetables in an ecological way? Um, and uh, we all know that uh, the one thing that we bump up against with organic vegetables is really that we do a lot of tillage. Um, um, people who know me know that uh, I like to work with you know, uh, weeding equipment and keeping my fields clean, although I also have worked very extensively with cover crops. Um, very long ago, um, we adopted a Nordell system. Is anyone familiar with the Nordells? Everybody is. They are my heroes. So we have been you know, alternating uh, on our vegetable farm in Kinderhook with cover crops one year, green manures, and then vegetable crop production the other year. We've actually improved our soil health that way. I know I heard a lot today about saying that we cannot increase organic matter with cover crops alone. My question is really how tall were these cover crops? Because we have really brought our organic matter up from about 1.2, 1.4 to 2.4. It's not a lot, it takes 15 years to get there. But one of the things is, is it the, another farm that I transitioned from very intensive vegetables to organic vegetables? is that we inherit the two farms where with excessive amount of phosphorus and excessive amount of potassium in the soil. So bringing in animal fertilizer was not an option for us. The only way that we could complement really growing organic vegetables was by bringing significant amount of nitrogen into our system um, by fixing nitrogen out of the air. And also by doing that, we have also fixed tremendous amount of carbon out of the air. All right, go back to the pro pharma training. I'm pushing them to do something more innovative. So we said like, okay, we've looked at all the stuff that's being done with um, minimum till vegetables, and uh, we're gonna try a couple of things. Oh, I lost the screen, oh, here we go. So, we do quite a bit of conventional till vegetables. The curriculum is based on five groups of vegetables, of which some of the groups of the vegetables um, in the brassica, the brassica is one group, lend themselves quite well for a particular part in the season. Um, not for the early brassicas, but definitely for the later brassicas to be um, planted in rolled and crimped uh, vetch or, ro or rolled and crimped arsenic field peas. Um, also, the other group that we have, uh, the legumes, lend themselves very well to be uh, planted through rolled and crimped rye. Um, oh, by the way, my apologies if anyone thought I was going to talk about mixed species here. 
Um, I'm not talking about mixed or mixtures here. It's pretty uh, simple, veg or rye. Um, we really wanted to address the whole idea about if you are planting your brassicas in rye, we already know that we're going to be having to bring in a lot of nitrogen uh, to offset the, 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 the fact that the rye is so high in, um, in carbon. So we wanted to make sure that we could bring the veg, um, the veg would bring in the nitrogen needed for the brassicas to grow. Oh, actually, let me say one thing. I'm, also, I'm not going to really talk much about the edamame and the snap beans. <coughs> um, those are kind of like the easy ones. Um, we've been growing at the farm hub uh, soybeans, uh, true rolled and creamed rye for a number of years. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at it, um, pretty good weed control in there. So I think we learned there. Uh, the snap beans worked equally well. Um, we were a little concerned with the machine harvesting. We were going to pick up the rice straw. It wasn't an issue at all. What I want to focus on is more on this one here, Austrian winter peas. Um, <coughs> also, we tried uh, field peas with bell beans. That did not work. Um, I've you know, used for many years a rotation whereby I plant field peas and bell beans in the spring and I work them under, and that gives us up to 200 pounds of nitrogen to grow a broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. Um, actually, I know that we are fixing that much because Lori Greenwater had a graduate student go out and actually find out how much we were actually fixing. And we don't put any fertilizer down except boron to grow these crops. When we rolled and crimped them, they disappear too fast. The Austin winter peas stayed around a little bit longer. So we, using a, um, Crimper, everybody familiar with it. But then also what we do is, we were thinking like how we're gonna kill it all in one shot. Well, we were thinking about it with the pro farmers who went around, and we said like, well, why don't you just cut it? It's an, you know, an indeterminate crop. So the problem with that is, is that it flowers at different times. So either we're gonna roll it three times and get going over it, or we're gonna try to kill it all at once. So we just hooked behind our tractor, we hooked the, the no-till drill, and we just cut it. And the cutting actually immediately uh, killed it. So this is what it looked like. We had a good stand of the Austin winter peas. And then um, the other thing we wanted to resolve is how are you gonna plant through that? Uh, we had some funding. We bought this RJ planter that um, Ryan uses as well in free fill. And um, we got that <laughs> from you. <laughs> and we, we enjoyed working with it. Uh, except that we think that maybe it is more than what we really need. Um, what we're founding is that we really don't need some of the equipment on there. We took the um, row cleaners off almost immediately. They made a mess. And then also the shank, where is the clicker here? This here is a shank here that they insisted to have on there. Um, we took that off. Uh, the ground is pretty soft in a minimum till system. This is not a no-till system by any means. So we took great care in preparing the seed bed in the year before. And then really all you need really to plant into a crop like this is really a double disc opener. And then over here is a wavy coulter. If you have this and the double disc opener, you can use any transplanter to get your crop in the ground. You can see here how that works. So here's after planting, this is um, 26th of June. And then it grew. And then you can see the weeds were coming in. So here, we definitely saw we didn't have enough biomass to really have good weed control. But there was good growth in it. And uh, so what we ended up doing, we went through it with a uh, Lilliston rolling cultivator. Um, I had to clean it up after every pass, but otherwise it worked relatively decent. And then we had the crew hand haul it. Unfortunately, I cannot share how many hours it took. This is a 0.7 acre piece that we um, uh, hand hold, um, and, um, but you know, it, it, uh, it was definitely about between 40 and 50 hours that I remember uh, that we spent on that. So that's a lot of hours. Uh, again, you know, cost was not an issue for us. This was a learning experience. So it kept growing. Um, and then let me see, you can see there's some weeds growing in there, but at this point the canopy starts to close up. You can see the weeds are growing a little higher. 
Now this is really interesting. I believe, I hope that the slides are on the same day. They're, yeah, the same day. You can see here, this is really important for me, this is observation. I mean, none of this, what I'm bringing to you is research. This is really like us trying some things out and throwing some, you know, paint at the wall and see what sticks. But this is interesting, uh, irrigated equally. Um, the plot, we did a side-by-side -side comparison, it's wilting. And if you look at this one here, even with the wheat competition, there's no wilting over here. So that's pretty striking. So we were very happy with that. So then we harvested it. Um, and let me see, um, after mowing. And yield is not great, but it is about the same as in our conventional plots. So um, that's the first one that I want to share with you. Um, then the vetch, we tried that as well. Same thing, it's an indeterminate plant, so we wanted to cut it, which we didn't do with the rye, by the way. With the rye, we just waited until antesis, rolled it, and rolled it again after the soybeans came over, the edamame came up. Um, here we go. You can see it's all cut. You can see those, um, how that's all cut. <coughs> okay, this is actually just a slide again, but this is corn. We also did corn. Oh, this is actually meant for the corn. We'll do a cauliflower later. This is corn. Uh, one more slide of that. Corn after planting in the vetch. So, and we actually saw much better weed control in the corn uh, from the vetch than we saw in the Austrian field piece. Right, uh, corn, uh, again, Observations, very healthy crop. Again, less, um, the wilting point was, you know, um, of, of such a degree that it didn't seem to suffer as much with a hot days compared to the other. You can see some weeds coming in though, but the canopy is closing up. And then, let me see. These are all irrigated fields. I will uh, mention that to you. And then this is close to harvest. Um, we had uh, 300 bags to the acre, which was more than our conventional till. Our conventional was around 250, 250 bags to the acre. So that was a surprising number to us. That we saw that the uh, ears um, were fuller uh, from that lot. And I think it had something to do with you know, no water stress. So there was something to say for that. Uh, it's hard for us to compare one lot to the other, especially when you have bird damage. These are 300 bags marketable ears. So, you know, again, this is not research. Uh, so, but still, it was, it was a good yield. And we see these yields consistently when we transplant corn. Everybody always laughs when we transplant corn, but we find that we can plant twice as much corn from half the acres if we transplant because of the stand. And we grow the extra tender varieties that really don't germinate very well. All right, lastly, the, uh, we also transplant a cauliflower, true vetch, and I'm just showing some later slides. I'm not gonna go through the whole sequence again. And um, here, uh, harvesting, oh, no, this is hoeing. We, we de they did spend some time hoeing there, pulling out the big weeds. Now, when we went out there, uh, we had a visit by Jan Hendrik Krupp, and I, Klaus Martens already mentioned him before, he came by at the farm up and he went out there and the first thing, give me a shovel. And it was really great and educational for all of us. And um, um, I should have taken slides from the conventional till plots because they were powder. And then here we had some really, it's hard to see on the slide, but there's wormholes everywhere. You can see the worms right here. And it was a really remarkable difference in soil structure. Um, the soil wasn't blocky, it was a nice rounded uh, texture to it where it was in the cauliflower compared to the cauliflower that was conventional till. Here maybe a better shot. Um, anyone familiar with John Hendrik crop? Okay. So September 19th. Uh, that crop stayed really clean. We, that, the hoeing in here was relatively minimal. Um, we did pull out some big weeds. Uh, let me see, September 21st. I don't have yield numbers, but here I come again with some anecdotal stuff. 
um, regarding uh, what the crew was telling me as well. Um, they loved harvesting cauliflower in that section. It didn't stink. It was like, this is a very really clean section. The cauliflower is very <coughs> high quality. And it was really, um, the, the crop did not deteriorate as fast in the field. Um, again, we had less tip burn in this cauliflower. Again, a lot to do with the water management, I think, in, of the soil that we were working with. So while this really started as an experiment and saying like, okay, we have nothing to lose. Um, I can make mistakes and I, we were really pleased and we're gonna continue with, with this experiment. Um, what would we change? I think we, well, we already did um, mix in some triticale and some rye in our vetch to get a little bit more biomass. Um, we'll see how that works. <coughs> we hope that the triticale and rye will not dominate the vetch, but you know, it's something that, uh, to see if we get better weed control. Now the next step is for us, we're sold on this system. The next step right now for us will be to um, see if we can eliminate the, the hand hoeing. Um, and that will be kind of interesting. I'll keep it short because the IPA is waiting. <laughs> Right, some questions? Right. How long? Yeah, so how long oh, there is a date on there, so I could actually tell you. Well, I think um, I normally when I do weed control, I control weeds when I can't see them, right? That's n the normal way of thinking about weeds. In this case, and that's where the Lilston comes in, the weeds were about this big. We had some over the carpet, so hence the aggressive way of using it. How many weeks it was after, I have to look up the dates again if I go back through the slides. Um, but, you know, the, the, the broccoli, uh, I could not have waited much longer because I would have been driven um, with my tractor tires on the plants. So pretty soon after that, the canopy started to close. Um, but I don't get the second part of your question. Well, the first part was like, if you didn't think of the veg as a mulch. Yeah. Yeah, we would have to. Um, this is pretty weedy ground. Um, so it's, it's not that, um, in, in, in the conventional tail, it would be cultivated three times by that point. Um, the second question is, it seems like the, the, the top of our had better weed control. Yes. I think it's the Austrian field piece compared to the vetch. Mm -hmm. It's really the vetch had better weed control than Austrian field piece. And then if you put the, uh, the, the, the regular 40-10 field piece, it's even worse. Um, we abandoned it. Um, we did, after rolling and crimping, we made a visual inspection and we, we walked the field and we said like, all right, is this going to work? If we see weeds right now, then we're not going to do it. I mean, we, and, and some of that has to do with a fall seeding of Austrian um, field peas, is that there were very little weeds under the Austrian field piece. With the 4010 field piece and the bell beans, weeds germinated along with um, the field piece that were planted in the spring. So there, that was a big difference. So if we saw wheat, and I want, if anyone wants to try this, um, I, I would say that the one thing that we learned from this is that we do all our weeding in the year before. So the year before, when, before we planted the field piece, uh, the Austin field piece and the vets and the rye, um, we had a bare fallow. So this is by no means like we didn't do tillage. We did a lot of tillage in the year before. So we made sure we did all our tillage. And um, so our aim is not to be no-till. Um, our aim is to not disturb the soil and to provide greater plant health now. So it really has, and, and not to have too much erosion when the plants are still young. 
By the way, none of these crops um, w got any fertilizer, except for boron, not even the corn. Yes? I want to clarify, you said you cut the uh, cover crop, but was that just running over it with a no-till drill? Yeah, that's all you have to do. Yeah, so um, pretty much uh, I, we didn't have to apply a lot of pressure. Um, this no-till drill does have hydraulic pressure, um, but it didn't take a lot of pressure to have the coulters uh, run uh, and, and cut the, the cover crop. They cut only into the soil. They don't cut underneath. No, they don't cut they underneath. Don't they, kill, they don't really kill the cover crop. Well, that that is a that is a possibility. Although I think, um, well, what do we say, Matt, about that? Do you think that the no-till drill? What do you think the action was? You think it was the second rolling that did all the work, or is it the cutting? I don't think that the, the wheels would be able to provide enough pressure on it. So it, it's probably a combination in reality. But I don't think that you know, smashing it down is really going to do it. Uh, some of the cutting, you know, or some just rolling that, that blade over it, you know, if, if you're not writing, you know, the rod that's going down and going in between it, then you're cutting something and you're putting pressure directly on those on those stems. So I think that would probably have a bit more. I, you know, I know what you're saying about the gauge wheels, you know, helping out there, but um, it's not like they have any, um, you know, points on them where, you know, it's, it's pretty soft, you know. Yeah. Tractors, you know, I, I think that, you know, that's a lot more weight, though, on the tractor tire compared to the weight of an individual gauge wheel for, you know, a bunch of them lined up in a row like that with a no-till planter. Mm-hmm. On the unit, on the, the no-till drill, can be uh, 200 pounds, right? Or on the coulter, yes. On the, on the unit, on each. Yeah, yeah. Can be quite a lot on those John Deere. I can't believe you. Well, it is cut every seven and a half inches, so you, it's, it's really, these coulters are quite close. But you might be right, we, I'm, we just thought it was the cutting and maybe it's not the cutting. <laughs> but it does work. And it did kill it because we, one, we rolled some stuff and then we did not, we're like, it's not dying, what are we going to do? So, like, let's run over to the no-till drill. I mean, again. <laughs> Any more questions? How big were your sweet corn plants in the track? How big were they? Uh, they were, I mean, we actually, we are going to go to a smaller plant that's only two weeks old. These plants were, um, I believe, 18 days. Yeah, and they were, they were actually their double plant in a 72. We want to go back to a double plant in a 162 um, because it just took too much time to carry the trays to the transplanter. So that was one thing that uh, we have to buy another shoe for that with the RJ planter. Um, but that was one thing we want to correct. We, we thought we needed a big plant. Um, we, we had not done this before. <coughs> We can definitely stick with a 162. And we plant every 14 inches two plants. Yes. One last question. The next crop we, we will try, aside from those ones. We're going to stick to those for now. Um, <laughs> um, but we want to try a little bit with the transfer mulch and um, initially try that on potatoes. Um, and, and, and bring mulch on after the potatoes are planted, enriched, and then put the mulch on top of them and then not to touch them. Um, because we do have some wheat issues in the potatoes, but that's a whole different system altogether. Well, thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, at cornell.edu.